Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the snowy wonderland of Seattle. Uh, we got a little dusting last night, which is kind of cool. I've also done a few tweaks to the OBS to help get chat into window alerts and all that good stuff. So I got Streamlabs enabled. I also have this other webcam along with the webcam you see pointed at the snow out there. Um, this is the book we're going over. If you just enjoyed previous sessions, you probably know about the book already. It's a great book. Solidly covers the Go language. This is episode 5 where I'm using this as in previous sessions and we'll be going to continue using it in ongoing sessions. That basically is kind of the path that we're going on. It's uh, pretty fucking brilliant. And we're going to be covering functions today, as you can see there. Now let's see, I'm going to put us a little bookmark, maybe some lens cover stuff. I am Adrian Hall. And uh, let's see here. few of the other transition views I have now is whenever I'm yabbering, you get to see me and the screen up in the whoops up in the corner there. But then whenever we get into the code, we will definitely dive into it like this. Where maybe I'll be yapping or not or whatever. And then when I don't need to talk specifically, I'll transition to this view. So right now though, I'm gonna be talking for just a minute more. Uh, before we get started, like I said, we're going to be covering functions today. Then later today, uh, later today, I am planning to continue streaming after the function section of the book and the material, maybe with a little bit more go, but I will be streaming to work on a number of additional cool things that are worth knowing how to do. May even show a little bit of Kaden Live video editing and or Photoshop or GIMP tweaking actually. Uh, why do they call it GIMP? I still don't remember. Anyway, oh, new image manipulation program, something like that. Uh, so we'll be covering that and that'll be in a couple hours after this session. So if you're interested in uh, more programming, more video editing, tweaking, whatever, that will be something you might want to tune into. Um, let's see here. In the meantime, we're going to get some tunes going on in the background. And we are going to transition to the more usable view here. Alright. So here's my machine. I feel like I should check this out too. Let's see here. Getting started. All right, today in functions land, we're going to start off just looking at function declarations. Plain and simple, nothing crazy complex there. Uh, stuff falling on my head here. So let's go ahead and create a new project. And we're going to call it like the previous ones we did. Let's open that up and take a look. There we go. So the previous one was, well, that wasn't learning go to, it was episode three. Or episode four, I meant. So we're going to do an episode five. So this will be learning go episode five. Um, we're going to start with the 
and go ahead and create that. No file. Let's go ahead and now add a main.go. And then we'll also add dot get ignore file. Normal procedure here. Let's go out and use one that already exists. Because that's just an easier way to do it. Change this to five, and that should cover the bases there. Cool. And then over here, let's go ahead and create the repo. repo. There we go. We'll go ahead and get this added in here. Let's bounce down to the terminal. It's here. That is in window. Oh no wait. It's in view to a windows terminal or alt F12. So we'll get init. There we go. We initialized our git repo. Now we can do git add all or git add dot does the same thing. Git commit first commit. All right? Cool. So then we need to check our remote and get it added. So no remotes listed. Git remote add origin. There we go. Oops. Paste that in there. Boom. We now have our origin. So next step is to push this up. Push dash u origin master. Like so. There we go. So now episode 5 should show, sure enough, the repo with the two files. Let's add a readme. Oops. Add that first readme blurb. And then in here, let's look at VCS. Oops, VCS. And we'll do a, what is it, pool. Yeah, let's do a pool. So we haven't talked about this before in the Goland IDE. This is the Git uh, VCS integration. So it's mapped to the right place because we just added that remote branch. This is the root um, strategy. What do we want? Resolve recursive octopus hours subtree. So different options and how to pull that. I'm just going to do a straight pull. Just say pull. Should be clean because we literally have the one file. Created readme. So now we have that here in our editor where we want it. All right, so that looks good. And now we can get into the, the important stuff here. Let's get some code written. So functions in Go. Uh, functions in Go, every single application starts with a function, right? So you have the main function. You have to have that. And that kind of harkens back to older languages too, like C, C++, even C Sharp, etc. Pretty much every application needs an entry point 
in which the application starts, whether it's a CLI application or a web application really, or, or anything. Every single application needs some type of entry point. And for Go, that entry point is func main or function main. It's, it always needs to be in the main.go file and no matter what, that has to exist or you have no program whatsoever, right? The way you'll see that is what I have right here, the uh, func main and the package main, right? That's, that's always the starting point. So then if we go beyond that, you know, the standard hello world is print, you know, print line, hello. And then that always adds the format, you know, and uh, one of the core libraries, and boom, we're off and running. So let's get ourselves a little build here just to be able to run that. We'll do a package. Uh, we don't need any arguments. And that should be it. So now, oh, whoops, I, I don't like it when I leave a lousy name up there. Just say go build and run. All right, boom. And then we'll run that with the debugger. Nyan cat starts hauling butt, and boom. Here we are. Notice the the go build, the first build for an application always kind of takes a minute. Um, but it always speeds up after that. And it takes just seconds after the first build. Which, what in the world? That is taking a minute. Install, da da da. No, I just want you to run. I'll show that in the future. Please stop and rerun. There we go. Okay. There, we got a good build and everything. So this is a funk, right? Funk is a main. But we can do so much more with this. Uh, the basic construction is funk, then name, then there's a parameter list here, right? And let's give it a legitimate one. So we'll we'll actually declare some functions here and look at what we can do with uh, function declarations. So there's func, and then call it some function. Now, recently, uh, there were a few tweets and blog entries that I noted where someone had detailed the kind of the absurdity of naming something like some function or some integer or some string. You don't want to name your variables like this, right? You want to give your variable or your function a name that's telling. Because, for example, I wouldn't call myself Adrian Human or Adrian Person. You already know I'm a person. I'm a human, right? Uh, just like you don't name your truck like Frank Truck or Chevrolet Truck. It is a Chevrolet Truck. Um, but... It, you don't need to call it truck every time. You just say it's a Chevrolet or it's a Nissan or whatever. So we don't need to attach what it is to the name. We just go with the name. So let's, I'm going to break my habit when I'm teaching stuff and stop calling things like some function. We'll call this uh, example execution thing. <laughs> Not much better, but you get the idea. It, that's its name. It's going to be the example. Actually, let's call it this. Let's call it example executor. There we go. So then we have parentheses to put our parameter list in. So this is a list of parameters. Basically, uh, values that you want to pass into the function to process. That's all it is. Nothing more. Um, and then there's the actual function body. This is the only required part here. So now I could say I don't even need to pass in a parameter. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Oh yeah, yeah, I just I had switched because I was just running my mouth. Alright, so example X here. Let's, let's say we want to do print line and say this is the sample execution of a go function, right? And in main, we're going to remove that and we're going to actually call the function. Boom. When I call it, you also see goLand 
color codes this appropriately to show that it is actually used. When it's not, something isn't used, it's grayed out like that, which in the case of Go usually means you need to remove it from the code base. Um, in other program languages, like you can have all sorts of functions and methods in Java and C Sharp and things like that declared and, and defined and have all this code in it, and they may not actually be executed. And in Go, because of its strong typing and everything else, the way the compiler works, you can't have a lot of dead code in there. You have to call it. It has to be called from somewhere. So this is a good way to be able to see that you have it called. In those other languages, it's a good way to notice what you may need to just remove from the code base. But I digress. This is about Go, so I'm going to keep yapping about Go. All right, so we have this. And if I run this right now, it'll actually execute and print that line out, right? Just like that. But now, if I want to do something, let's say, let's declare, hmm, uh, this, and that, this ints, right? And then let's declare, or assign this the value of 2, and that the value of 42, and then we'll do format print f, and let's just say numbers. Right, pretty straightforward there. D, and then D. And notice the underlined squiggly there means I haven't it's passed in the things that need to be interpolated into that string. So we're going to say this and that, and the little squigglies go away. All right, so now we have a functional element there that's working. But let's say we wanted to pass these things in. We didn't want the function to have to hold those values. Uh, they, they might be dynamic from another calling function or even from user input. So let's look at that. Let's say uh, var this, that, int. Okay, and then we're going to assign them just like here. Right, and we'll pass them in instead. Now if I put this and that, you'll see the red squiggly. Goland gets pretty awesome here. I'm going to hit Alt-Enter. It says, function call options. What do I need to do here? It's telling me that there's too many arguments that don't exist in the function. Let's see if there's a refactor to change signature. Oh, does it not work that direction? It might not. So let's go ahead and just manually put them in. This, that, int. Note how I declared those. Basically the same way I have them declared here. Now I could do something like this int, because in the case of, let's say, that being an int and this being a string, you know, you'd be able to, you'd want to be able to declare those two things. And let's do that actually. Change that to that, and this is going to be a string. Like so. And this 42 needs to be a string. And boom, there we go. All right, so now we need to change this verb here to a uh, string, which is it? Yes, yeah, there we go. And now if I run that, that's going to work too, just the same way. We've got numbers two and 42. Even though, of course, we wrote numbers in here, and that's now a lie, because this is a string. The number 42 is actually a string, the number 2 is an int. Now, the other part to this, we're passing in a parameter list, but we can also get a result, right? So we'll put it in parens, and we'll just say, actually, let's do this. If there's one result, you can say int, just like that. And I'm going to say return this. Okay, now over here, to take the result, that singular result, we'd have to say result. Oops. That doesn't work, right? We'd have to do a short assignment. Or we can say var result int. And then we can go down here and just do the assignment like that, right? unused variable. That just simply means 
we need to do something with that variable. Print, print line, and we'll say result. Okay. And actually, if we run that, boom, same thing, right? We've got 2, 42, but then 2 is stuck on the end of it. Because um, note, we don't have a new line here, right? So this print line would just add on to the end of that one in string formatting. So let's, let's go ahead and add that there. Now if we run it, we'll at least get it on a new line. Cool. Now if we wanted to return two results though, let's say this, and then we're going to have a string message. Now note, if I put them like this, that doesn't work, right? What you need to do when you have multiple parameters is put them in parens, just like that, parentheses. So now my return breaks because I have more than one result, right? But let's just add this so it returns. Okay, there we go. That's a good return. This one needs its second result now. So I'm going to ignore that string. It's coming back because it's an empty string. Okay. But let's turn, let's not ignore it. And let's say message. We'll call it a message. And go up here. We'll declare a message. And let's actually clean this up to two per line here. Result. There we go. Now what I want to do is let's change this to a function, or I mean format, print f, and then we'll say, uh, say first we're going to print out the string, and then let's uh, new line, and then the answer, right, comma, so then we want the message and then the result. So basically, we'll print out the message, and then on the new line, the number will be printed, right? So we're going to remove that one. Here we go. Okay, now note when, let's see here, the result comes back. This is going to print this autonomous of this stuff printing, as you just saw a minute ago. Let's see here. This is the result now. Actually, let's say this is the result and then let's put in uh, the number, the string number, we'll call it that. Yeah, there we go. So since that is a string, it should concatenate accordingly. If I wanted to concatenate these and say that, that's not going to work because that's a string, not an int. It's expecting an int for that first returned value. Okay. But right now we have int being returned with this, and then we have this is the result that. So we'll run it. And boom, we got a result. This is the result, 42, and then the number 2 below that. Right? Um, so that's, <laughs> that's basically the whole thing for declaring a function in Go. It's pretty straightforward um, and you really can only do uh, the one type of declaration there really isn't like overloading or dynamic functions or anything like that it's just functions period end of story let's look at some recursion here and get into some more complex functions. So this is all fine and dandy. First function look. There we go. Commit and push. That's going to go to master. There we go. And now we want to go to a branch. Let's see about VCS branching again. So I like to swap back and forth between here's branches. Doing this in the IDE and also doing it in the terminal. Just got tag or revision. I just want to do a new branch. 
let's call this a uh, function recursion. All right, so now that just came over there with all this code, and we don't actually want all this code. So I'm gonna take that out, remove our function, and Goland removed our imports as it should. And now we're gonna get into some good stuff here. Now this example is available in the book that I'm gonna start diving into here if you've gotten the book. So it's right here, recursion, page 121. Uh, oh, a truck just went by, crazy people driving. All right, first we need to type. So we're gonna type node struct and get this set up. So type, node type, there we go. Then we want data, string, and attribute. As attribute. Oh, don't want it in the array. There we go. Attribute. Then we're going to say first child, next sibling, and then pointer to node. All right. Then we're going to set up another one. Type, node type, iota, declare this. Let's put HTML in though. That's the one I'm going after. No, stop. Giving me the wrong one here. Unused import. Oh, that's added a bunch of crazy stuff. I didn't want that. Hmm. Iota. Oh, did I miss a? Ah, there we go. Okay, that's the. So the go the example needs a thing that go or this doesn't know about right now. So we're gonna do golang. Dot org net. Dot org slash net. HTML. Can I resolve HTML? All right, it can't find that attribute. You, let's see here. Well, what we can do is this. Actually use some dependency management here. Make sure I have depth installed, yep. So we're gonna do depth init. Oh, uh, right, I'm able to redo deduce repository and source from this thing. How about let's go get golang.org slash net slash html. Golang.org slash net o slash x. Ah, there we go. That should be it. Let's try that. Net. We'll do a depth and net on that. Where do we get anything? Ah, uh, there we go. So that pulled into dependency that time. Golang dot org x net. Yeah, cool beans. Now we need to add that to the git ignore so we don't end up committing the vendor directory. Ah. And it, we have it in there already. Cool. So we're going to add these. Control Alt A adds them to the next commit. Vendor is grayed out. It should not be in there. 
It almost is like it's a little confused about this stuff. So I'm going to get add, get ignore. Do a status. Two new files and a modified file. And this is all for the new branch we made, which is function recursion. So let's actually do a commit git commit first commit for function recursion origin function recursion. So now we'll have that up there. Yeah, there we go. Function recursion. Cool. All the good bits. So now we get back into the code here. That was a little confusing for a second, but what's it say? Unused import. Well, it should be not unused. I hope something between now and me doing an example with it hasn't changed. <laughs> anyway, let's write some more code and see where we get. Whoops. So we got a node type of iota, and then we're going to set some constants here. Error node equals node type zero. And then we got a text node, document node, element node, comment node, and doc type node. As you can see, it's the, uh, huh, interesting, text now. Seems like it likes some of those and does not like other ones. Let's go to the declaration of that and see what we get. No usage found in project files. All right, well, we're going to keep moving forward and see where we get here. So the next thing we want is type attribute. Oops, struct. Oh, there we go. I knew this had to be declared somewhere. Key, val, and they need to be string. Right? Yep. As you can see, we're kind of what we're doing is we're rebuilding HTML for parsing. In effect. So all right, we got that, and then. Let's put in a function for our parser. Parser r io dot reader. And then we're going to do. Whoops. We're going to return a pointer node and the error, respective error. Pretty standard way to declare that. So, let's see here. We got another function we need to add. We're going to add that in a second. What we're going to do, though, is we're actually setting up something uh, as per the example. Uh, A, a recursive function is basically a function that calls itself, right? And the idea is when you go through HTML, you want to be able to call into itself however many times something is nested. So when you have something like HTML, XML, JSON, etc., any of those file formats, you need to be able to recursively call into it, step through the different tree structures within that file, pick out the key values so that you know what's in it to be able to parse. Um, that's effectively how everything parses XML and other things like that. And that's what this, this function and this program is going to do, is it's going to step through and do various things to all of this. All right. I'm trying to see what the next step is here. All right, let's get a... Uh, 
Hey, let's write some basic functionality into our main here. Doc um, er is equal to HTML dot parse and then we'll do OS dot standard in. Okay. So that's gonna let us take in a parameter. So we'll pass like a the web page or something like that. And if error is not equal to nil. F and let's do S standard error. We'll do find links. V new line and error. OS dot exit. Oops, not executable. That's of course if there's an error. If not, we want to step in link We're going to get to the visit function in just a second. Doc. And there we go. Here we're going to do format print line link. Oops, too many too many prints. All right, now we're going to have we're going to add another function. We'll come back to this one in a second. Let's see return. Actually, oops, there we go. Come back to that parser stuff in a minute. So we're going to have the visit func. And the visit is going to take links and start building them. And we're going to have basically a node in the HTML, whatever it is that we pass in, the HTML page or whatnot. And then we're going to pass back a string array of items, which can then be recursively passed into the next visit function call, okay, to make it recursive. So f, if, if, in dot type uh, equals HTML element node and in dot data is equal to a then boom we're in business right because a a ref is the href tag right so then we want to do for a range of in dot attributes so that's the attributes of the uh, a href tag right so you got href in there you got link you got source and several others that you might want to use um, or get the values of. But what we want to do is go through and we want to find what's your A key the href tag itself and then take an action on that right which is to links and we're going to append it to our slice of links links a dot bow right so that is now going to be our recursive function that steps into our call gets all this stuff done and then returns it back out for us to be able to call the function again if we need to so then for c and dot first child c is not equal to nil c equals c dot next sibling and at this point this is where we're calling our function again so we're going to actually call the visit function from the visit function okay visit links we're passing in that value so it can append to it c is our html node and continue to step into that, but work from the pointer of it so that it's not moving that around in memory either. It takes the one copy of it and then steps through that copy without shifting around data or anything like that, just looking at it 
but then building autonomously of that the links array. So you have both things, right, building up this data. And then finally, we want to return the links after all that's done. So the root thing calling this visit function down here loop, will look into that page, find all the links, print them out, and then exit. All right, so let's see, what are we doing here? Unhandled error. Oh yeah, that's that's fine. We're not going to handle the error this time. Invalid constant type. Unused import. All right, well let's read that import. Error node node type. It's right there. <laughs> invalid constant type. So that's what the example has. Hmm. So we get a build out of that? I think it'll break on that. Undefined iota. See that kind of starts the value. So it'll go 0, 1, 2, da da da. Then no type, invalid constant type, error type, or error node. <clears throat> Do I even use this thing? Error node. So I use element node there. Then I use oops, yeah, element node. First child, next sibling, which are these values. Hmm. So just let's let's break, see what happens. Oh, you know what? That is probably declared in HTML already. That's interesting. Yeah, so let's let's get rid of that actually. I'm just gonna go with this. See where we get. So we do a build undefined iota. Iota should not be undefined. So we gotta figure out what the deal is with that. Anybody see an issue there? Just checking something real quick. Ah, uh, see what the deal is there. It's a dog running around in the snow now. You can see him over there. It's so strangely choppy on the webcam. It's kind of funny. Anyway, <laughs> back to the business at hand. Alright, so I don't know what to do with the iota. I don't know why it's... I've done something and I am missing what the key there is. It's a 
Let's do that. Let's try to just run it again. What happens if I take that out? I just do this. <laughs> of course. Well, let's look at what that is, right? So, Golang, Iota. Let's talk about that. I think I know what the deal is, but... Uh, maybe that's... We'll explain it good. So here's constant declaration. So that's kind of like how I try to declare the constant, right? But then it was acting flaky. So this will be... Yeah, so it shows... If you print it out, you take a constant, you declare it like this. Then you print it out, it'll be 1, 2, 3. If you do iota plus 1. So iota basically sets it to 0, right? And then, yeah, if you do type, actually, int, type. Hmm. HTML parse reads a sequence of bytes, da 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 da, HTML several kinds of nodes. Yeah, hmm. Oh, I see what I fat fingered. I'm tripping. So, the example didn't actually have iota. <laughs> uh, sometimes when you miss the most obvious stuff. So, it needs declared there. Okay, and then let's try to let's do this again. Constant an error node node type. So these are going to be node types, and then I'm going to start at that, right? And then text node document node element node comment node and doc type node. Yeah, okay. Now I should build, right? Yeah, there we go. So now the thing is, we can't just really build this like that. We need to add a parameter to pass it. But before I do that, let's talk about it at the terminal. So if I do go build and then pass the parameter that I want it to execute as if I was executing the command line, um, we'll see it work, right? So I can do it this way. Go build and then let's say composite code dot blog, right? Boom. Oh, whoops. Oh, actually, let's see. I need to do let's do go build per the example here. Go pl dot io chapter one fetch. Cannot find package fetch. Oh, it's saying go do that. Damn it. Um, hmm. I think I can do go install pl.io, channel one, fetch. Can't load package. Right, okay. Let's see here. Um, this is actually built on the code from chapter one fetch code. So let's do, well, I know what we can do. Clear CD list. Let's do git clone go pl dot. Well, it might not be clonable. Well, let's give it a go anyway. Chapter one fetch. We're just going to go out to it. Let's see if we can't get that program. So go pl.io chapter one. Oops. Chapter one. Fetch. Chapter one. No. Ah. 
Nothing like trying to start from the middle of something and realizing it doesn't work because you need the old stuff. So anyway, let's look at our code. We're just going to hack it to make it work for us. So we need to get the HTML stuff. And here it says HTML parse os.standard. Uh, let's just do if we can do this HTMS dot composite code dot blog. I don't think that's going to work, but string does not implement IO reader. Oh, okay. Go lame. Get HTML IO reader. Actually, let's do this. I'm going to get the page, composite code.blog, and then right click on the page and save page as. Then we'll go into documents. Hey, where's my, there's my code. Go, source, github.com, Adrian, episode 5. And we're going to actually save this page, composite, whoops. Composite code blog dot html. Actually, we'll just go with composite code html. So we're going to save that. Now if we go back to here, we'll see it in there. There's the files and stuff. But here's the main page. It's got a whole bunch of html, right? And if we open it, open in terminal, open in browser, just go look at it in Chrome real quick. Oh, that's right. I don't have that installed in the right place. We'll do Firefox. There we go. There we go. So that's the localhost copy of this, right? So close that for a second. Close this. And then let's talk about... So HTML parse needs a reader. <clears throat> so what we need to do is there we go. Go lang open file into IO reader. There we go. Perfect example, right? Pretty simple. So OS file So let's file Neil. Oh, yeah. So we'll need to do that though. Let's see. IO.reader go line. IO reader example. So we really need. Uh, there we go. So we just need to pass a string into a new reader, right? So we're going to do that here. Boom. And then we actually need to get that string from the file. So we need to pull the string in from something. So let's say go lang open file and read. Reading files. Here we go. IOUtil read file. And it returns an error and the data. So let's throw that in here. And then we're going to say if error is not equal to nil, go on. If it is, though, format print line, let's print out the error. And here we're going to change this to our file, composite code.html. And then that is going to be our, let's call it HTML data. There we 
change this to this. There we go. So now we have a reader, and we can pass it in. So this is this right here is basically what that other example most likely does. Oh, we need to change that to a byte array. So golang string to byte. Whoops, byte array. So again, some little stack overflow programming here. So we basically want to do this. Like that. Say HTML data here. Oops. And then we're gonna actually take that typing, put it in there like that. Cannot use the type by as type string. Oh well, let's far HTML uh, data equals byte. Oops, byte. There we go. And then HTML. Well, HTML. Oops, didn't want to do that. Declaring it here. So now we'll say um, byte and then pass in HTML data. Oh, let's HTML. Oh, breaking my stupid rule. HTML bytes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> HTML bytes. Now, what the hell? Cannot use HTML bytes. Type byte as type string. Oh, I put this in the wrong damn place. HTML data. And then we need to do this with shell bytes. And then this is going to be R. No? Ah, what am I doing? Doing shit backwards. So this is the reader. That's what I want. There. And that's right. And this says, cannot use HTML data. Type string. No, that is that is what I wanted then, right? Cannot use HTML bytes. Type byte as type string. Well, then I should be able to take the string and put the string in there. Oh, I'm just going the wrong way. Damn it. Right? So that's what I need. HTML. But then my names aren't right either. So this is... Let's refactor this. HTML. Bytes. Um, shift F6. Uh, HTML strings. Or just say HTML. We're just going to call that. H no, we can't call it HTML because of the namespace conflict. So rename it and then HTML data. Oops. Oh, this is supposed to be. Uh, HTML content, let's go with that. And then HTML data. <sighs> there we go. Okay. Oh, we should probably do. Yeah, so that should be. Let's see what we get. Haha! -ha! Success! So there we go, these are all the links in that file, which are numerous.
right? So if I click this, for instance, that'll bring it up now. And this basically acts as a scraper for a web page. Pulls up the links and everything. Pretty slick, huh? And that is an example of a recursive file. Notice in the core bit here, in the main function, we call visit once, right? And then visit calls itself again to step through all of the HTML. Which in that page is numerous. But I mean, you can't beat that speed, right? I mean, how many, look at this freaking insane number of links on my blog. Like, I reference a lot of stuff on that blog. Content, composite code, da -da 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 -da, brrr, spits it all out. I don't even, I don't even know what half this stuff is. No, actually, I guess I kind of do. It's my blog. <laughs> all right, so that gives us a recursive function example. Um, now on to next things here. So looking through this, multiple return values. <clears throat> so let's talk about that. Anything in particular. So the multiple return values in this case, we return a string of the HTML link, right? And we return error. So that's the most common scenario you'll see is a value and then an error. An error will be the last thing returned. And generally speaking, you want error to be the last thing returned because that's where it's assumed to be. Um, so that's more talking about that example, digging through the various examples, or the various samples of things within that code, uh, which we've just talked about. Um, Oh, they have another one here, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Get some images. Let's see if that one works. Return. Oh, yeah, here's an interesting one. Oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about this because this is slick. Okay, so we just did the find links. All right, we're gonna do a count words and images. All right. just looked at the switch thing is going to get competitive with all the programming. So I'm going to add this. I added the composite code files. So that gives us something to work through. And then let's add this function. So we got func, oops, func, count, words, and images. Right? We're going to pass in a URL, string, um, and then we're going to do that. For the return values, we're going to have words, and we're going to have images, int, and then error, error, which will be an error type. Um, and then the function body, so there we go. Count word and images, of course, is grayed out because it's not called yet, and URL is not passed to. So let's get into this. Response, error, we do HTTP dot get, oops, dot dot get URL, All right? And then if error is not equal to nil, return. All right, and then let's do doc, 
error. We'll use HTML parse. And we'll do response body. That's the content that comes back from the request. And then response body. Close that. If error is not equal to nil. Oops, there we go. going to do format, print line, print out the error, return, we'll do words, oops, images equal count. Oh, this is going to be great. I don't think the example even is completed. <laughs> That's fine. We're going to complete it, though. So, words, images, and then return. And note the return here returns, and here's words and images. It's going to look for those, even though the words aren't in, passed in like this. It's going to look through the code base basically and find these values and return them. Okay, so now I can recursively call this function. So now I'm going to make a private function though and say count words and images. Okay, and then go to a pointer of the node and then pass back words, images, int. Right? Now in here do implement code to count these things. Ah! <laughs> right? And then return. So say bar words images int. Like so. Oh, that's not what I needed to do. I've already declared them because they're parameters, they're passed in. Duh. Words equals zero images equals zero. Okay, so now we need to uh, implement this. So what is the first thing we'd want to do to implement this? That is a good question. So we got all this stuff up here which is kind of a good example of stepping through and finding the links, right? So what we want to do is count words. I don't even know how we would count words in an HTML doc right off. So would we want to just count the words into p tags or something like that? Or would we want to do something else? Uh, that is the inherent question here. Um, let's see here. Let me think about that for a second. While we're thinking, we're going to look at snow, right? So the idea is to count words, I guess we can do, let's see here, we can count words by doing, hmm. so we can look in a text node, I think, that's what we need to do, and then we need to count, we need to do like a split of that node to look in the string. And then we also need to look for the image tag, right, IMG. And we can just count that, we can increase that. Um, so that's that's a good way to, inc well, yeah, I guess that could be the way we count it. So let's let's give that a go. Let's try to implement that. Uh, Where did my code thing go. Minimize my screen. There we go. Um, Alright. So if node type is equal to let's see your HTML dot text node. Yeah. 
So we'll do words, oops, words plus equal uh, length, strings dot split. I think it's n dot data, yeah. And we'll just do that on space. So that should break it apart and give us a good count of words. Hmm. Is it everything? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah. I'm going with it. So then, if it's that, then we're done. Bust out of this. Uh, I can go ahead and remove these. They don't need to be there. So that's if it's a text node. But if it's not a text node, it's going to be in dot data equals image, I think. We do images plus plus and return. Right? Hmm. Let's let's go with that. Let's see what we get. So down here, after we call our visit, let's do a count words and images, and we'll do the same thing with the URL. Actually, let's just go with composite code.html. I wonder if it'll need composite code.html. Will that work? Nine cat runs. Oh, yeah. We should do the result. Uh, let's say words, images, error. <laughs> we need that, right? Well, we probably need that. Then, do format.println words and then new line images right yeah let's do a semicolon there <coughs> words images I'm gonna leave the error unhandled for the moment so then W -I. Let's run that. Zero and zero. That's horrible. That's that's not the right count. Are they the return is int? What am I doing there? Why is that possible formatting directive in words? Da, 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 more and more. Oh, I did this. Yes, thank you for telling me there's a formatting directive when I called line. I do that all the time. There we go. Okay, so that printed out right. This is clearly not right though. So I'm not getting crap out of the text node. That's no good. Uh, oh, I got more logic to do here. So, like, let's hear else. If in dot first child. So if the node, yeah, if inside the node it's nil. Then we need to say. Yeah, I let's return words and images. Oh, yeah, we need it. Duh, I need to make recursive calls to, well, here you can see, in C Sharp, since you'd be able to override this you'd, uh, with uh, param the parameterized uh, function calls, or methods in C Sharp, the, the parameterized methods would be able to override each other. You'd have multiple types that could call into it in whatever type of way, like with the constructor or whatever. But in Go, we've actually declared two separate functions because we needed to here. Um, 
albeit they're still calling recursively, they just have to kind of operate at different levels because one's taking the URL string and one's taking the individual node within the URL string. Um, let's see, we need to do that and then take first child, um, I think, yeah, so that'll give us those values and then we can do words and then images. Oops. I think that'll count on. But then we, okay, we do first child, but then we need to do the sibling. We need, yeah, we need to work off of that too. So let's say if uh, n dot sib, what is it? Next sibling? Pretty, next sibling. It's not equal to nil. Then we need to basically do the same thing. Right? Yeah. So let's see if that gives us something. Oh, maybe it's because. Ah, let's actually try the page here because we're using the HTML function to call this, which actually does a get request. And I don't really think I can do a get request against the local one. So that's goofing that up. So we'll say HTTPS colon slash slash composite code dot blog. Like that. Let's try that. Oh, panic. <sighs> Where do we, we got to there. Well, let's remove this and just make sure this is. Oh, oops. Yeah, well, now we're not calling our function. <laughs> let's call something simpler, huh? Let's call HTMS, HTTPS, call calling google.com. Nope, still panics. Let's get to here. Let's get to, yeah, let's get to the call and our first recursive call into this content images. And let's see what we're getting here. So the first call into this gives us words and images. Should be zero, zero, right? We're calling Google. I wonder if I need to take off. Let's actually do this and restart it just in case. So still be zero, zero, yep. Error, no error yet. So then let's, uh, let's step into here. So in type, what do we got here? Type, nothing. Document node. Okay. So then here, we shouldn't have either one of those really. So we get to there, it's still zero. And this is not really gonna be anything. So let's step through again. We should step in and get, let's see here. Can I set a watch on this one? Add to watches, there we go. So, oh, here it is right here. Why did I add a watch? Remove, remove watch. So in here we got, let's see, parent. And let's look at first child. Oh, next sibling. It's first child. First child. Meta. Let's go until we get to here. Ah, hit a fatal. Ah. Uh. I don't even get to that. So 
So let's go. Debug. Okay, we get to word and images. We'll run through that. Boom to this. And then let's see our step. This is step to the next line executed. Oh, what? So we get into else. Oh, of course, it's not going to stop on the else line. Derp. So next sibling. So then that should run. Step to the next one here. Goes counts and words again. Back to this. First child. Next sibling. There we go. So in the sibling, we're going into that, stepping in, making another call with the text node. Oh, and then we need to unlock. Well, now we're going into crazy land. Oh dear goodness. I think I think what I'm trying to do here though is pretty obvious, right? <laughs> um Turn images data type. So the count images and that one should go through and recursively call these things. Oops. Oh, what? What did I just do? I just fixed it. So I'm calling Google. Well, let's try mine again. Composite code dot log like that. Let's try that. And what do we get? Words two, images zero. <laughs> That's a uh, that is incorrect. Let's try this. Oh my god, that is so incorrect. But it executes, so I don't know what I did there. Sorry about that. But anyway, the the, the function of all of this is good. So you see how it recursively calls itself to parse through this stuff. So I'm going to go with that one. And we'll move on here. This is going to commit and push to. Oh, I didn't leave a very good commit message. Probably should have told it to forget all those other bits. And I just committed the composite code underscore files because that's just nuts. Stuck here, come on. Just take this off for now. Get that commit in there. Actually, you know what? Just forget the UI. Let's do it clean old way here. Clean, get, add, all that stuff. Oh, whoops. Let's get back in the right directory. Minute. To recursive 
examples. Hmm, what's here? What is especially right out. All right, so the next thing in the book is an error section. Uh, it talks about how functions, some functions always succeed at their task. Now we know, obviously not all functions always succeed at their task, we just broke one. Uh, the idea, however, is, let's here, put that in here like that. There, you can actually see the book too. We can share the book, it's nice, it's nice. Um, yeah, so some functions always succeed at their task, other functions, succeed as long as their preconditions are met like time.date and time.time .time. Um, for other functions success is not assured and that's where errors come into play uh, let's see here where that's expected you have an error prospect and it's talking about that and the little example it gives is pretty interesting let's take a look at one of those Let's break out. There it is. Let's give ourselves a new branch here. Git branch. Oops, branch. Oh, actually, what is the shortcut key? We can do git branch. And that shows what we have. We can do git branch all to see all of our options, right? And then we can do git branch. And then name the next one, error handling strategies, right? But also we can do checkout, new branch and create branch called error handling strategies, right? There we go, boom, clear, get branch. We're on error handling strategies and the other two is function recursion and master. So an error handling roots to that. In error handling strategies, however, I'm going to go in and clean up our code again. Actually, I'm just going to delete this whole file. Delete the Go packages. Actually, pretty much everything in here because I want it nice and clean for us to write some more code in. <coughs> there we go. So now let's just add a file, new Go file, main, simple application. And there we go. Please add it to the repo. Error handling strategies starting point. Say commit. Oops. Commit starting point. I'm going to push that up. And it is now available in the repo. start putting some of these notes in the chat. Here's the, re the repo we're working with. And everything's in here, error handling strategies. Yeah, okay. So what is this? Oh yeah, we don't want to do that yet. Push detection, yep, thanks. All right, so let's let's write a little helper file here. Let's we'll say um, func check, and we'll say pass a error error, and then function body. 
Okay, and in here we'll say if oops error is not equal to nil, do a thing. So if it's nil though, we want to take an action. Let's just say format for now. We're going to format dot print line. Oh, do I have this? Yeah, okay, format print line. And we'll say an error occurred. Error dot, oops, just error. Actually, we just, we're just going to print out the error. Like that. Okay. So that's a little function to help us out. And let's call something. Let's say value error cache dot lookup key. And then we'll we'll kind of mock out our own little cache here. We'll say func cache. Or we'll just do lookup. Let's just do lookup. Uh, key is a string. And then we'll return the value, which will be a string. Like that. There we go. And then the key will be, let's call it, let's say, dog. We're looking for our dog. And then here we'll just put if key equals dog we will return oh yeah we need to do an error forgot all about the error derp there we go return empty string and let's see here do um, Format dot error f uh, dog isn't do s here um, actually we'll say key isn't here key blah isn't here got to word it right, right? Word the words right. Isn't here. And then we'll say key and then error. And so that's, that nests the error so that if there's an error in the error, then we get an even further looping through and verification of all that. And it gives us the actual error that occurred as deep down as, as possible so we can trace it down. Okay, so what's this supposed to be? Missing function body. Why are we missing function body? Oh, again, more than one return value, and we need to get into parens land here. Put that in parens. There we go. And this says, da da da. Oh, yeah, that is isn't here. And then we need to um, do a new line, and then we'll say error. And now we'll print out the error with it. Percent fee. I believe it's the right verb for that. For the book. And now we run this. Now we can say check error, right? So this is our little wrapper function, which is going to take a prospective error and handle it. Otherwise, we're going to say format.println. Yay. We found the Oh, let's do this to make it more, make more sense. Or key searching for make that a string, right? Then in this particular case, we do key searching for equals dog. And then key searching for, right? And then here we'll say, yay, we found the. Uh, Whatever it is, we found the key searching for. 
or we'll say print line. Uh, nope, no. Here, keep searching for. Right. Actually, no, that shouldn't work because we'd have to put that in the error. Let's actually do format dot print line. We're just going to do value for now. Boom, just like that. Okay. So now dog, we're saying it's not there. But let's say if the key equals cat, we can find the cat, right? Which is, of course, not reality based because if you're looking for a cat, you're not going to find the cat. If you're looking for a dog, you'll find the dog eventually. Um, you know, the way things tend to go. So we'll say return, you found the cat. Actually, let's return the cat's name. We'll call it uh, Sally. Format. Actually, we'll say nil. Oops, there we go. So as you've probably seen in the other errors, if you return nil, boom, you know, it continues. You don't, the, the nil passes, right, per here. If error is nil, then continuing. Uh, if it is not nil, then you want to print out the error. So in this case, if we're looking for dog and we run it, we're going to get an error, right? Boom. Oh, and Mr. what? Oh. Oh, yeah. So let's just do a return. We'll just say what? Oh, actually, we need to do we need to do it else. Well, this would be an else. So, if either of these, they're going to return. Otherwise, you're going to get that. There's no nest error there. So anyway, run that, and what do we get? <clears throat> What's that? Oh. I'm going to do actually let's say error we'll just do that net error runtime error let's find a not found error golang not found error that's what we should return right So what I want to do, I want to do error, and yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, I see what I'm doing wrong. So let's do that. Error equals, boom. Key. this and that oh yeah because we're writing our own key that I am just doing some of the dumbest stuff today but that's programming sometimes you're genius sometimes it's just pain and misery what does it say should not be capitalized or should end with punctuation it ends with punctuation Hmm. I believe Goland has not realized what punctuation is. So anyway, we're gonna go with that. Boom. Key dog isn't here. Right? So let's find a cat now. Sally, we found Sally. <sighs> Alright. So what else about error handling strategy should we discuss? I mean, error handling in Go is pretty... It's kind of a little crude. It's getting a little more advanced uh, as the versions iterate. Let's see, end of file. Function values. Hmm. 
Functions are first class values in Go. Like other functions, function values have types and they may be assigned to variables or passed. Oh, that's kind of an interesting thing to let's let's discuss that. That's important to know. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna actually wipe out our stuff here. Oh, I guess I should put that in there. Well, Basic error handler. All right, now let's actually create another file here. Go file. Um, we'll call it function values like so. Added to the repo. We're just going to keep it in the main package. No reason to add another package for this. And let's just say func uh, square to in int oops, int return an int. And that function is just going to do return n times n. Okay, so we'll get the square value of that, right? And then we're going to do another one. Let's do func. Well, I need to do this outside of main. Derp. And actually, we don't even we don't even need main in this function because it's in the other one. Ah, figdish. There we go. Okay. Now let's get rid of main without deleting everything. There we go. All right. So we got square, and then let's do funk negative n, we'll use that to test for n, int, return, uh, like that, return, dash, n, and we'll do funk uh, product, Return int, return n times n, and then let's do, uh, keep getting those parens when I need the other thing. And then func, let's do add m n int int return m plus n, and then let's do func divide. else can we do? Anything else? Well, whatever. Okay, and then if we want to call those, okay, we got that other bit in here, but let's call them. Let's say format uh, print line um, square. So let's do f, so you can see it. Th the function actually act as a first class value. So let's say the square of let's say four is and then we're gonna do this square pass in four like so format dot print f the negative of four is that. say negative four product of 
4 and 4 is that so it's a product and pass in 4 and 4 format print f so we got two more right we did the uh, I forgot what I did add and divide the addition of 4 and 4 is this F the division of four and four is D and so we get divide four and four. Right? Actually let's do let's do eight and four. Oh, that's a mess. In. <sighs> Here we go. And there's the values. All right. So we got those. That shows you how I call the function, and literally you get back the value, and the value is what is interpolated into that actual string that's then printed out, formatted with the with the verb formatter, right? So square, negative product, add, and divide all are single line functions that return an int that become that value effectively. Okay. Um, that's that's pretty useful to know, really. Uh, let's see here. What else do we got? Oh, anonymous functions. Right. So you want to take a little note here. Oh, we should we should actually put this in the, in the readme file. I don't know. Well. I'm going to do a new, let's do one right here on the desktop. Alright, so we'll do, go to the desktop, and touch readme.md. I keep meaning to do this, but I just kind of forget. So here, 151. Oops, anonymous functions. All right, and then we've already called, called, we did functions, we talked about their signatures, i.e. passing parameters and the return values, multiple return value parameters. Um, we did recursive, recursive functions. And what else did we? We just looked at something here. We looked at uh, oh, error handling strategies. Error handling strategy, or really just like the basic way you handle an error in Go. And we're about to hit on anonymous functions. All right, cool. So let's see here, yeah. <sighs> Anonymous functions. There we go, yeah. Okay. So, anonymous functions are pretty cool. Let's scoot that over there. Whoa, just hit a bunch of keys, didn't mean to hit. All right, there we go. So I don't know if I should clear up this file. I think I'm going to keep using it for this one. So we're going to have another one here. <clears throat> we declared a square over here. But let's go with... Hmm. Yeah, we're going to go with 
func. And then we'll call this squares, right? And then we're going to say func, boom, int. And you see how that's getting crazy, right? So we have our function name here, but then we have a func inside of that, okay, which is just like an anonymous function call. And then that has a body. And that body is basically being returned as a value, kind of the same way we just looked at the first class functional value, the first class value nature of the functions above. That's being returned as the body result of the function of squares. So let's let's step into this here. Let's say var x int return. Uh, come on, return func. So it's going to return a function that returns an int. Right again, that first class nature of this thing. X plus plus. Right, so we're additively adding up the x. Return x times x. Right, so x is increasing, and then we're getting the result of it. Okay, so calling it, getting the result, and just stepping up through it. So then, if we go back to main, and we want to get that result and print it out, let's say we declare something. We say it is equal to the result of squares. Well, not uppercase didn't, I didn't really need to. We're in the same library, so let's keep keep form here. Go with S. Doesn't need to be uppercase. There we go. And now down here we're gonna say format.print. I'm gonna go with print line and just put F. Just like that, right? So we're just calling it. And then you'll notice every time we call it, it's going to increment, right? Let's see. Let's see what our result is. Boom. There we go. So it took one. One, one. one times one is one. And then it goes to two. Two times two is four. And it goes to three. Three times three is nine. And on up, right? So it's going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine exactly as one would expect and because of the nature of this anonymous function you'll see you know the, the nested nature of it that's how the function is incrementing itself without any tangible notion of it being called right pretty cool way to accumulate something and know how much it's been called if you write it that way even without the caller particularly knowing that it's being incremented per se Right? Like you might just return the value, for instance. So that's another way to recursively call functions through using anonymous functions. All right, let's see. Oh, here's something. <clears throat> mm, it's variadic functions. So we have variadic functions here. <clears throat> Deferred function calls. So panic, of course, is of course when things just blow up, period. Let's look at that real quick. It's kind of a nutty thing. Let's commit this. Adding anonymous function examples and other code. There we go. And I'm going to do, oh actually let's branch. We use the ID this time. Vit 
We see a skit and branch, 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 branch. I'm missing it. Right in front, right in front of my face, of course. Branch, new branch. And let's talk about Pan X. Ah. <clears throat> that um, go back in here let's get rid of all this stuff in main there we go and then hmm. there's another we haven't really we haven't looked at a switch before a perfect time to look at a switch because I'm gonna write something with a switch. Let's see here. Um, start out like this switch S is oh, I have to spell it right. Switch is equal to um, call result um, thing. S and then the switch and then say case. Oops. Um, if we pass it in, it gives us, we'll say first. Um, say format that print line. Not use the switch. Let's just do. Let's do if true. If uh, let's make a bullet bull and we'll just test it, right? <clears throat> so var choose bull. Actually, let's just short short declare it. We'll say true to start with. Okay. So if choose we want this to happen. And it's going to say all is well. Else I'm going to say panic. This is how you make a panic, right? Format, let's print F. Oh my god. Oh, uh, this. And we'll say choose. And I'll say, actually, let's just go with this. So that's how you declare a panic, that something has blown up, right? So the, the type system catches a lot of compiler mistakes. However, um, if you get in, you know, these are like out of bound arrays of arrays, things like that. You've seen a lot of them as we've worked through this code. <clears throat> However, uh, sometimes you need to set a panic. Um, when a panic occurs, all execution stops. The Go program just dies, right? Spits it up. Uh, basically, it's it is an error in the general sense. Um, this this is I don't know. It's not always something that you want to call, though. You want to set up error and handle the errors. Is what you want to do. You don't want your application to just whimsically panic. This is something that, for example, very serious has occurred. Uh, and you need the program to just stop, period. Uh, that's what a panic is for. In a way, it also, I mean, it looks like an exception, but it's not. It's, it's breaking things. It's breaking the, the program. 
which is what makes it stop. So let's run this. All is well. So now let's say all is not well. False. We're going to panic. There you go. See, it spits us out here into the panic thing. Fatal panic. The thing blows up, right? So I'm just going to run on through. And this is what our error message will look like when we get a panic. Panic. Oh my god. Oh, this. Thing blew up. If I go there, because it has the code, it'll point us at the exact line. So this is what panicked. In our case, of course, nothing specific. All right, so that's, that's groovy. Panics are an important thing to know. Um, and it really is just that simple. Uh, recovery, some of this stuff I kind of want to cover later. Um, methods. So there is a paradigm in Go called functions, which we've been looking at. That is the thing you call and you get result back from, perform some type of calculation, those types of things, right? Uh, however, um, <clears throat> at some points, there is another thing. And this is, this kind of comes from, okay, got to add this caveat first. Go is not an object-oriented programming language. However, it has object-oriented paradigms in it. Uh, similarly to how you probably may know if you know JavaScript or are familiar with JavaScript, JavaScript is not an object-oriented programming language, but it has object-oriented paradigms. Uh, and they're kind of just picked. You know, ones that they found, the language creators found useful is what they put into the language. Uh, in the case of Go, uh, one of the things is methods. Okay, A method is a function that's associated with a type. In object-oriented programming paradigms, a type would be an object. And in Go, you could call it an object. Um, it doesn't have all of the exact uh, capabilities of an object in object-oriented programming paradigms. There's a certain amount of inheritance or polymorphism that it's not going to have, just simply won't have. Um, but it does come off, a uh, method comes off of a type, and a method is something that you would execute by doing type dot method. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see here. Let's get one of these declared because this is something that's very commonly used in the language and something you'll see just really all of the time. Uh, oh, and they got, a, they got a great example in the book. So we're just going to go with that one. Let's see here. Whoops. It's back in the code here. Let's call this thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my own example, but it's gonna be very similar to the one in the book, page 156. So type methods. Oh, whoops. Let's so that let's do a branch off of this actually. Get branches. Um, oh, we should commit this first. Let's see here. We'll just say panic example. This is at 206. And we're going to get into uh, type methods. Oh, I thought I hit commit already. Go ahead, do it. There you go. <clears throat> so I'm going to take this out. We'll just call it um, app or 
universe. There's uni. Oh, universe. There we go. And in universe, let's create a file. We're just going to simply call it universe also. So we want this to be universe. And this is going to be whatevs. We're going to call it, um, let's see here, type, say point, struct, x, y, float 64. Yeah. Then we're going to say funk. Distance in our universe is going to be P, Q, point, and return a float. Not float, float 64. There um, we go. And let's see a return math dot put news q dot x minus p dot x equals q um, dot y minus p dot y. Right? E, e, uh, yes. Okay, now you'll notice this is not called. It is a dead function so far. Unused. But all right, we have that in there. But now let's say we say universe. Universe. All right? Uh, look at there, we have point, which is the type. And then we have distance, which is the function. So say distance. And I don't know, 12.2, uh, 14.9. Um, Oh, I don't know how to declare a thing, apparently. I thought that was point type untyped float. Oh, do I need to do... Well, okay. Anyway, let's get the rest of this declared here before I confuse myself further. Result. Oh, all right. Now, you'll notice it imported it here for us already. Thank you, Goland. Now let's do format.println and we'll just print out the result like so. And then it says type point more. Oh yeah, yeah, duh. Okay, so let's let's do that. Let's say um, uh, we'll do p equals point yeah, universe dot point. Let's say twelve point two, and then thirteen point four. And then we'll say Q is equal to universe point. Also dot point. And let's say what's here? I don't know. Twenty nine point nine two. Uh, and then twenty three dot one. <coughs> and now we can do PQ. It's PQ. There we go. All right. And if I run that, boom. Oops. What's our result? This fancy number. So there we go. So this is a function method right here. Distance is what we refer to that as a function method. It's a function, but because it's on a type, it's a function method, right? Versus just a standalone function. Um, and because it's on that package, that gives us the thing off of the type, right? So this function method. This is, actually, I don't remember what it's called in Go. But in most object-oriented programming languages, a type off of a package like this, or an object, would be referred to as a property, right? Um, so yeah, that is that is a trippy little thing there. So let's do this, and we'll commit that. 
example of a function method. I'm doing this twice for some reason. Weird. And there we go. So at this point, I'm looking, there's two of us. I'm about to call this a wrap. And we are going to raid all two of us to someone else. The question is, who should we raid? A. Other soul. Who should we raid? Alright, I'm looking through some of the people. Um, doing things right now. And it looks like we have... Bob Ross is of course creating art, and so is Killer Nin and Andy Face. Dev Chatter is doing some stuff and so is Vipa Game oh he's, he's streaming somebody else who is that's oh, Dev Chatters is he going or is he streaming me I'll find out in a second just checking that oh yeah he's going alright so let's do let's do a raid of Dev Chatter Right? Dev Chatter. Oops. There we go. That'll kick off in just a second as I roll the off.